morning of 9-11, I was uh, across the harbor and the first plane hit. And being a little jaded from many responses, I was like, ah, you know, it's probably some stupid pilot was trying to get a closer look for his client. And they, you know, the winds over that harbor and up, up the Hudson River corridor are just brutal. So I figured he just got buffered it over and hit the building. Second plane hit. Uh, I immediately knew we were under attack. We had a training manual in the 90s that said, it was a picture of the towers with a bullseye. It said, not a matter of if, but a matter of when, be prepared. So I raced across the Verrazano Bridge. I got into command and I checked in and command said, the 40th Battalion command said, a uh, bunch of guys will be coming in, sign them in the book and commandeer a city bus and get there. We basically took a city bus and the driver stayed with us and we commandeered it. We threw the passengers off, we took our gear, and we, uh, we raced to the Trade Center. You are about to embark upon the Great Crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. I was born in Brooklyn, New York, uh, raised in Staten Island, New York, which was considered the country back then. And uh, my, my main influence uh, was my father, my father Paul, who I'm blessed to still have in my life. He's, he's going to be 85. Uh, he was an Air, uh, Air Force Air Crash Rescue Firefighter who uh, proudly met President Eisenhower back uh, in his tour of duty between 57 and 61. And then my dad went on to a uh, almost 35-year career with the New York City Fire Department. So uh, as a very young boy, um, I wanted to be my dad. That was, you know, my example, my hero, my role model. So uh, yeah, I followed my dad. I had taken the city exams, uh, police, fire, corrections. I was only 18 and you had to wait till you're at least 20 to get on. So I was uh, failing out of college and my father just uh, wasn't too happy. So he said, look, uh, you know, you're gonna screw this up. So maybe join the army and, and uh, I went down to the recruiter and I got the, a little bit worried about going for four years because I knew I was pretty close to getting hired by the city. So I did the reserve option. Um, and you know, looking back, I kind of regret it. I wish I would have went active duty, um, gotten a four year experience, but um, you know, had to go through the full basic training like any soldier uh, down Fort McClellan, Alabama. And uh, originally I uh, was trained as an MP and then uh, eventually cross-trained and transferred into the New York Guard as a combat medic uh, assigned to an armored cav unit, uh, 101st Cav, 42nd Infantry, and uh, finished up there in the 90s, uh, you know, was uh, starting to have a family, and um, my main goal, I guess, was to get to the fire department like my father, and, you know, back then, it was a very competitive test. It was over 75,000 people from around the United States tested for uh, 2,500 positions that would open in, in a four-year list, say, for, for FDMY. And I just remember saying to my dad, man, that's, I don't know, you don't know what I have what it takes. And he said, well, how bad do you want it? I said, really more than anything in this world. And he said, then you'll get it. And I, by the grace of God, I studied hard and trained hard for the physical fitness test. and. Uh, you know, after uh, some time with the police, I got called and I had to resign from the PD and, as we call it, roll over to the fire department. So, um, you know, it was great. I, I, I got to, uh, one of those few people, I guess, in life that got to live their dream. You know, I, I achieved my life's dream and I was uh, doing that at 22 years old as a fireman. I was assigned to this truck, uh, Ladder 114, which uh, is lovingly known as Tally Ho. Um, there was an airborne ranger who jumped Normandy, Jack Carroll. When he got home from the war, he got hired by the department. And uh, when they first got radios, um, he refused to say 10-4 when you respond on the radio, which you're supposed to do, and he'd say tally-ho. So he used to piss off the dispatchers pretty much, but it sort of caught on and took a life of its own. So now um, at a 350 engine and ladder companies in New York City Fire Department, um, 114 truck is considered pretty much one of the only ones that's called by its nickname, Tally Ho, not its number. So it kind of irks some other guys. It's sort of that, you know, jocular uh, competition kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, so this was my beloved Tally Ho. Um, I was off duty the morning of 9-11, uh, working one of my moonlights. Uh, at the time, I was uh, running three jobs, you know, trying to keep my wife home, raise 
raise babies and uh you know the old-fashioned way i'm just that's how i was raised and we chose to do that and um morning of 9 11 i was uh across the harbor in staten island north end uh delivering uh heating oil for a company that i work for quinlan fuel really great folks treated me well and the first plane hit and i just uh, i was aware of it i'm big news radio guy and I, I heard it and I looked, I could see across the harbor and I could see the smoke of the plane and I had hit and impacted. And being a little jaded from many responses, I was like, ah, you know, it's probably some stupid pilot was trying to get a closer look for his client and they, you know, the winds over that harbor and up, up the Hudson River corridor are just brutal. So I figured he just got buffeted over and hit the building and then, you know, the FDMY, you have 10,000 guys, so they don't want you just, uh, you know, willy-nilly running in after something off-duty because of accountability, um, very much like the military. You know, there's protocol, there's, there's, you know, units, and they know where you are, who you are. So I continued on my day, but the, in the back of my mind, I was just like, I don't know, though, this just doesn't look right. It's a lot of smoke. So I started to head back toward the shop, and I was like, ah, let me, let me, I might have to go, I don't know, I just some weird feeling, and then all of a sudden, second plane hit, uh, I immediately knew we were under attack. You know, we, we, uh, we had a training manual in the 90s that said, it was a picture of the towers, and it said, with a bullseye, it said, not a matter of if, but a matter of when, be prepared. So we sort of knew that they were gonna come back, you know, because 1993, they hit us, but they didn't succeed in taking the building down. In today's media landscape, finding news you can trust can seem overwhelming. For history enthusiasts, most of us miss the days when news was just the facts. That's why Ground News is so valuable. Ground News is a website and app created to give readers a transparent way to read the news with access to over 50,000 news sources across the political spectrum. With every story, you can compare headlines, see who owns the source, and where the bias leans in an article giving you the complete overview of every story. For example, this story on the U.S. military strategy in the Pacific has been covered by 11 different sources across the spectrum. We can also get a visual representation of where the source's bias leans on the bias distribution chart. And as I scroll down, I see every article on the topic, compare headlines, and note each article's bias and degree of factuality. Note that left-leaning articles often focus on the U.S. Marines' tactical preparation against Chinese ambitions, while right-leaning articles emphasize shifts in U.S. and Japanese collaboration. It's these tools that help make us more informed consumers of the news. One of the most innovative features is the Ground News Blind Spot feed, which highlights stories disproportionately covered by one side of the political spectrum. Ground News checks blind spots in the news, and helps us check our own blind spots. Crucial in our duty to be informed citizens. Go to ground.news AVC and subscribe to get 40% off unlimited access to the platform with Vantage subscription. Your subscription will not only help support our mission to present history directly from the history makers, but to support an independent platform working to make the news more transparent. So I raced into my command. Uh, we have a, a protocol called recall in New York City. And if you're Firefighter, police, EMS, uh, for any large mass incident, like very, very large, you're obligated to respond to your command off duty and check in and find out your further orders. So I raced across the Verrazano Bridge. I, I told my boss I had to go and I was flying and strange enough, there was no traffic. It was a, just a clear, stunning blue morning. It was warm for September, it was kind of strange delivering heating oil, it was like 75 degrees. And uh, I could now see the buildings as I'm coming over the bridge are just, you know, fully involved smoke. And it just, it just looked strange, it was surreal. It was as if I was watching a, uh, a movie, a horror movie from my windshield. And uh, got into command and I checked in and my ladder company 114 was already dispatched to the Trade Center, the on-duty platoon. And command said, the 40th Battalion command said, a uh, bunch of guys will be coming in, sign them in the book, and commandeer a city bus and get there. So we did that. A um, bunch of guys came in, one of the lieutenants came in, Brian, and, and we, we, we basically took a city bus, and the, the driver stayed with us, and we commandeered it. We threw the passengers off. We took our gear, and we, uh, we raced to the Trade Center with the knowledge that our guys were there, our friends, our ladder company. And uh, as we got over the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, mid-span, the second tower came down and we 
we just became aware that you know we we just lost our guys we we assumed we lost thousands and thousands of people in the building and we just felt like me personally I felt like I failed them you know I felt like I didn't get to my guys my friends you know my team in time and and it was just a it was just a strange feeling it wasn't like we shirked our duty or docked our duty we were just late so we got in there and um, we started searching. Uh, initially, they had us search the buildings that um, were a side seven World Trade Center before it went down. And there was reports of trapped people in the, the big post office over on the west side. And you know, there was just so many different reports coming in. And we didn't have all the equipment and the radios that you, know, you would have on duty because we were off duty. So we did our best. We were then redeployed toward the evening time to search the main pile for the people who were trapped, which at the time we figured there'd be hundreds, thousands to take out. And um, it turned out that, you know, the only viable humans that came out were a couple of our members that were, were trapped, but you know, rescued fairly early on in the day. And then uh, well into that night, into the next morning, there was a couple of Port Authority police officers and if I remember it correctly, they were the only last survivors that were taken out of the pile. And, you know, we were just there for hours and hours. And it just became a little hauntingly obvious that we weren't going to find many people. Um, everything was just completely destroyed. You know, it was just piles of, of dust and powder and twisted steel. and. And you just looked at it and said, my God, if, if, it, if the forces involved in a collapse can do this much damage to this, this building, how can a human being make it out of it? And unfortunately, in the end, um, that was the case. I don't think there was more than like 160 intact human beings that were retrieved from, from the site. One of my dear friends I grew up with, John Shart, we were tight play football together, baseball together, you know, learn to drive with them. And you just, you know, drank our first beers together when we weren't supposed to at like 15. And, you know, he was on duty. He was a fireman. And he died. He died that morning. And I knew going over the bridge that he was on duty. And I knew engine 201, his engine was there. And I didn't want to think about it, but I kind of found out that afternoon that I, I'd never see him again. And uh, I got home four days later, and my wife was trying to, you know, keep things normal for the kids and for everybody. And she said, well, I have some good news. We're, we're going to have another baby. Um, I'm pregnant. And I looked at her, and I said, well, I mean, that's great. But, you know, um, I just found out on the way home that John's, she knew by then John was missing. And, you know, I said, John's wife's pregnant, too. and he's not going to see his baby and and you know that that guilt just immediately planted itself in my soul and uh in May of 02 his little boy John Jr was born and then 3 days later my beautiful little daughter Catherine was brought to the earth and it, it, it's i mean I adore my children and my my youngest and it it's just but every step of her life that I've watched and and my two other children it just brings me joy, but it's shrouded in guilt um, because my friend didn't get a chance to share that joy of his children. So, uh, you know, but the, the shining, I guess, silver lining for me, so to speak, was coming home to find out that I was being blessed with another child. Uh, and it just, you know, but this tragedy kind of took away from that and I feel bad, you know. When we got relieved that next morning and sent back to clean up, um, we had to walk about a quarter mile, maybe a half a mile from where they dropped us off with a bus up a hill to our firehouse. And uh, I just remember my crew, we were just like, we were just all hacking and we, it, was, it was just so hard to breathe. And, and I just remember going, man, I, what is wrong? And I said to one, one of the guys said to me, well, we're all dead. And I said, no, Dan, we, we made it out. And he goes, no, no, he says, you feel what you're feeling right now. He said, this is poison. He goes, we're all gonna die from this. And you know, like, at first I, I was like, nah, he's wrong. You know, this is just a temporary irritation, you know. And then all of a sudden, you know, 
uh, it took a it took a little while for it to set in, but for months we all had like coughs and we were hacking and it was like a bronchitis and you know they called it the uh, the World Trade Center cough. And all of a sudden, like in late '02, but more like I think it was '03, guys started coming down with some serious respiratory disorders and and cancer. So it was almost like this toxic brew of, of chemicals. And I remember this strange incident. Um, so someone had did a scientific study on all the dust and it was very early on, it was the spring of 02. And at the time I went with my wife to the baby doctor, she was due and he, he had become a friend, you know, I really liked hanging with him. Not that we hung out, but you know, whenever I'd see him at the doc, just, fun conversation and you know common interests we were both brooklyn kids and he looked at me and i said hey doc can you look at this list of what they just put in the paper what we were exposed to what do you think and he studied it for a good two minutes and, he, and it was about 20 elements that they listed you know benzene and you know beryllium and uh, iron and you know um, mercury and all these things and he just looked at me very matter of fact and he said um I'm really worried for you. He said, you are going to get cancer. He didn't even say you may, he just said you are. And he started explaining what, what this chemical does, what that chemical does. And he was pretty right on the mark because benzene is one of the lists and benzene is considered one of the main stressors or agitators to cause leukemia, which I have. So, and he just said to me, he said, but worse than that, he said, don't have any more children. And I said, well, Doc, what do you mean by that? I, I'd love to have a couple more, you know? And he says, no, no, listen to me. He says, this and this causes some serious effects to newborn children, you know, in the embryo, in utero. And he said, I hate to say this, but I think you guys are gonna have problems in the future with people who have children. And sure enough, there's been, it's never really publicized, but there's been many, many guys who, who you know had children post 9/11, and now their children have a lot of issues. So to me, you know, the combination of you know burning fuels, you know, there was a lot of jet fuel from the planes. There was plastic. There was polyvinyl chloride. You know, the carpeting, the computers, all of this stuff, and a com combination of just a burn pile, because you know the fires at the trade center burned for months because a lot of them were stuck underground and in pockets and. So there was this constant exposure to smoke and to dust and to, to chemicals. So we just knew right away the way we felt, like, wow, this isn't good. And, you know, initially we didn't really have the protection we needed. They handed you a, a little painter's mask, which within 10 minutes was just soaked completely through from sweat, dirt. You couldn't breathe. You just took it and threw it away and you just went on your search. So 2011, they picked me up on a blood test, department medical, and my bloods were just off the graph crazy. It was a Friday morning, and they pulled me off the truck. I was immediately relieved from duty. I was told if I got a cut, I could bleed to death. So I said, well, I want to come in right now to the clinic, the department clinic. You know, it was 9.30 in the morning. And they're like, no, 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 just, just come in Monday. And... Uh, they all want to go home on Friday. That's the bottom line. They want to get out of there early because they want to beat the traffic, you know, going south. There's the traffic going to the shore, going east. There's traffic going out to the Hamptons. And, and then all of it just percolates in the middle of the city. So I go in that Monday and um, I made the mistake of that weekend asking some medical people that I knew in my family, um, what does this whole no platelets or, you know, thing mean? And, and uh, they all resoundingly said, look, I'm not too happy to tell you this, but that could be blood cancer. That's not good. Get to the, get to the hospital. I said, no, no, I'm going in to see them one day. And so I go in, and one of the other department doctors, is a bit of a, I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on this, but a bit of an asshole with an attitude. No one really liked him, and his whole mission was to get anyone who's sick or hurt back to duty immediately because that runs into overtime for the department. And I looked at him, he says, what are you doing here? And I said, pardon me, sir. And he says, what are, you, what are you here for? And I said, I hand him now my blood work. He takes one look and I said, he goes, 
yeah, go see your own doctor, who happened to be one of the fire department doctors on the outside, and uh, you're on desk duty tomorrow. So I said, Doc, excuse me, can you give me an exam? I said, I, I, my stomach is, I feel like there's a football going to explode in my belly. And he went, oh, busy weekend, insinuating I was drinking. And he goes, I'm not your doctor. I'm here for your duty status. Go ride a desk next. And I jumped up and I almost tore his f***ing head off. So, excuse me, but because it was my, my organic reaction that I knew there was something wrong. I could barely get to that clinic that day. I mean, I was just fading. So the admin came in and he uh, intervened and intercepted me before I lost my job. And another doctor overheard it and she got panicked. She said, oh, she knew this guy was a jerk. She looked at my paperwork and she went, Oof, okay, who's your doctor? I said, so-and-so. Okay, go see her immediately tomorrow. You are not on admin duty. I want you to go for um, a sonogram, an x-ray, this and that. So she cared enough to get me moving along. So my doctor, who I had the previous history with, right away when I came in, the first thing she asked is, how's the drinking? And I'm like, here we go again. And I said, I feel like I'm dying. And she said, oh, here we go again with the WebMD. And I'm like, oh, God, is this lady my doctor? Or, or you know, she just my adversary. Well, three and a half weeks later, I'm getting stretched out with tests and this and that. I'm waiting for a differential diagnosis as to what the hell is going on. And I show up for a, a, an appointment with her that she didn't show up to. And I went down. And the charge doctor that day on the duty, he coded me. He called 911. Two ambulances came in. And this giant paramedic I knew from the street we used to cut people out of car wrecks and hand them over to him. He sees me laying there and he's like, what the hell's going on, man? You're, you're as red as a tomato. And he kidding around. He said, well, you out surfing in the sun? And I said, Doc, I'm too fat to fly the surfboard. Here you go. And he takes a look at my paperwork and he went, whoa, how come you're not in the hospital? So this was three hours after I went for my appointment and the doctor didn't show up. She comes strutting in annoyed because they brought her back. And she says, so what's going on here today, Lieutenant? As if annoyed. And the paramedic just completely intercepted it. He says, excuse me, ma'am. She's like, who are you? I'm paramedic Jones and you know, so and so. I believe this gentleman might have blood cancer. Look at this, this, and this. And she went, Phew. she goes, and it was crazy. I, I, I thought I was in the middle of a dream. My stomach now was way out to here. He goes, spleen's about to rupture, this and that. Blood pressure's 240 over 140. And she went, the spleen is probably from drinking, because that's all they did after 9-11. And the blood pressure is probably an anxiety attack. And he went, thank you, have a nice day. Raced me to a trauma center, which was a cancer center, a Methodist hospital. And the doctor took one look at me and he said, why weren't you here three weeks ago, a month ago? And I just started crying. I said, doc, I've been begging for someone to tell me what the hell is wrong. He said, well, we're gonna. They drilled into my hip. Came back, six, six doctors came in and I went, oh boy. Either these guys are looking to run a tab or I'm a dead man. Cause usually you see one doc, two, not six. They told me what was wrong. They said, you know, it's advanced hairy cell leukemia. We got to fly in the, the treatment, it's so rare. It's coming from Cleveland Clinic. It's gonna take whatever. All right, and they, they laid it on the line and they said, look, you're gonna get hit with two and a half years of chemo and seven days compression protocol, just bags this big, never stop. If it works, you go in a remission. And I said, what's that? And they said, well, it's just getting ahead of the cancer. And I said, well, what happens if we don't get remission? And they said, you're, you're gonna die. And I just, you know, sledgehammer to the chest. I was just like, okay, how do I tell my family this? So sat my family down, they came in. I didn't never really told my kids what was going on. I told them that, uh, I got too fat and they needed to uh, keep me here for a while till I lose weight. And all of a sudden, it's about the seventh, eighth day into this. And when once they hit you at this chemo, you feel like you're burning to death from inside out. It's, it's vicious, but it's doing its job. And then walks this doctor and she sits down and she crosses her leg like this and she takes a phone call, gives me that, gives me that again. And then says, what is it that's wrong with you today, Lieutenant, with a very 
uh, arrogant inflection. And I almost, I couldn't believe it. And I had lost my hearing from the chemo and I couldn't see so well. It, it just wrecks you. And I, I was incredulous. I was just like, excuse me? She said it again and I just, I just dismissed her. I said, you're, you're fired from my case. You're not my doctor, get out of here. So the, the folks that were caring for me at that time, they were great. They were wonderful. My, my, my nurses were angels on earth and they saved my life. But it was crushing to serve this department for 22 years. You know, I was on a ceremony team, the honor guard funeral team, trying to, you know, give respect and dignity to the families of the guys we lost and to always cast a good image of our job. And now all of a sudden in my moment of need, I'm, I'm being treated like I don't exist. And I held on to that for a while. It was anger, it was resentment. Now I'm past it. I'm, I'm a cancer survivor. I'm a grateful, grateful American. And, you know, I, I've, I still mention it, but I, I've let that go. But I can't say to you I wasn't a little bit angry for quite a while because, you know, when you're in the world of helping people and in the military and medical, you never turn your back on somebody and just leave them. And I felt like this doctor just left me and just took off, and uh, it hurt. But anyway, been blessed to stay ahead of this now for a long time. Uh, it's kind of a mystery uh, remission. You just don't know how long it'll last. But you know, my father's a miracle. I mean, he was he was sent home to die in 1978 with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and they gave him a trial study drug, and they hit him so hard for for four years every two weeks. He's still here, so I'm hoping I have his genes and uh, I have his uh, blessing that I'll last that long as well.